I grew up in Georgia, two hours south of Atlanta in a small town called Warner Robins. And how small is it? Uh, I think it's 50,000 people. Okay, and um, how big is your family? Uh, my immediate family, I've got three, uh, three uh, siblings, so two sisters, myself and my parents, and then uh, like most Indian families, I probably have 20 first cousins in this country. Nice. And where do you, where are you in the line? I, I'm the eldest of, uh, of the siblings. So what kind of responsibility does that have? Uh, it requires uh, not getting your sisters to cry so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, and what time period were you growing up in Georgia? Uh, I grew up in Georgia from first grade to high school. I graduated from high school there. And what years were those? That was 1996. And what was that experience like for you? It was great. I think Georgia is a great place to grow up. A uh, small town uh, in the south. You know, people have misconceptions, but I thought it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, and being Indian American, did you ever find any like cultural conflict or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, of course. I mean, I grew up vegetarian there. And uh, you know, the south, at least 20 years ago, was probably not the most vegetarian-friendly place in the world. So you have that. But I think for the most part, people were very, very friendly and very welcoming. Uh, my town had a military base next to it, so we had a lot of people that would transition that had lived abroad, so I think it had a little bit broader view than others. Um, and how many people were at the, which base was it? It's called War Robins, it's actually called Robins Air Force Base. Okay, so, and was your family affiliated in any way? None whatsoever, yeah. And what do your parents do? Uh, my dad's a doctor, he's an OB, and my mom's a homemaker. Okay. And um, so were there any expectations for you being the firstborn? Of course. Uh, so of my cousins born in the country, I have five older cousins. All five went into medicine. I was the first that, uh, that didn't, so one could call me the black sheep. <laughs> and what was their reaction? You know, they were surprisingly supportive when they decided in college that I wanted to join the military, the Air Force. Uh, you know, my dad was very supportive. He understood the reasons why I wanted to do it, which was uh, which was very encouraging. You know, mom's a mom. She doesn't want her son flying airplanes that uh, you know that only have one guy in them. But she's come around. They're very. I think they're very proud. So, what was it that drew you to that lifestyle or to the planes? To the Air Force, the military. Yeah. Well, so you know, as all little kids, I loved airplanes. Uh, I just never grew up. Uh, you know, I was went to middle school and high school there and we'd see planes flying around from the base so uh, it was something that I thought was very very cool. Uh, in college I started flying little Cessnas around which was fun but I wanted to fly something a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. But you know you don't join the military or the Air Force just to fly airplanes, it's not a flying club. Uh, so uh, while I was there I, I became a public policy major and I wanted to serve uh, in a physical capacity and for me serving was, was in the military. Air Force told me I could fly jets and serve at the same time. Said, this is the best deal I've heard. Sign me up. And off I went. And um, was that before or after 9-11? Because some people signed up after 9-11. Before 9-11. <clears throat> Interesting story, though. I signed up for the military and was selected to flight school before 9-11. I didn't actually start flight school until after 9-11. And I was actually living in New York City on that, uh, on that date. So, uh, and I found myself in pilot training December of that same year. So it was, uh, I had a very personal connection. And can you elaborate on that? Like, what was that experience like for you? Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a, uh, an unbelievable episode. I was on. I was in. I was consulting for a year before my my flight school slot, and I was, I think, on the 53rd and Lex in the office, and we saw the news reports, and you know, it was uh, a very troubling. You know, we after the, the building went down, we left. We could see every street in Manhattan was traffic was northbound and covered in suit. Um, you know, the, the city was in, a, was in a lockdown, and you know, this was the first major attack on U.S. soil since Pearl Harbor. So uh, I, 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 thought, I, found, I, I was very thankful that I was then going to have an opportunity to, to, be, you know, to be a part of, uh, of the defense of the nation afterward. And so it, was, uh, it, it gave me a lot of, uh, I guess, a sense of, of meaning and purpose to go to, to, go to flight school. So clearly, you know, it takes two and a half years to get through it, but... Uh, that was, that was kind of my view. Um, was it because you're familiar with planes? Was there any like I don't know particular feeling you had about it, or I don't know? 
Oh, you mean in terms of the 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 attacks, yeah. the terrorist attacks? Uh, you know, I think it was just it was just shocking. It's something that was beyond the nation's collective imagination of of this kind of dastardly uh, a, a attack. And um, you know, what was interesting was after that, after the the planes uh, the impact for the next month, we had 24/7 combat air patrol. So F-16s would be circling over the city at low altitude. And actually, it was my unit that was doing the majority of those patrols. I was in the New Jersey Air National Guard waiting to go to flight school for them. And so there were guys that uh, I had known in the, in the squadron that were actually doing that. And uh, so, you know, so that, that, was, that again brought it a little closer to home. Um, OK, so tell me about the first time you flew. What was that feeling? First time you flew in a military airplane? Let's see. Well, I let's do in life first. <laughs> The first time you were actually off the ground. When, I was at the, when I'm at the controls? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that would be in college. Uh, I flew a, a Cessna with an instructor and absolutely found out I absolutely loved it. And it was so cool to be you know, up there with the, with the birds, even though you're, you know, you're in a Cessna, which is basically a, you know, a, a big plane with a lawnmower engine in the front. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I, the military flying is a whole different world. You know, the first flight I flew in was in Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma. It was in a T-37, which is a twin-engine subsonic jet. And your first flight, you're doing aerobatics. And if it's the first time you're doing aerobatics, which it was for me, uh, you know, your stomach's sometimes not so happy with you. So <laughs> uh, I had to use the plastic bag that was there. But then you know, your body adapts, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. You know, I think the, the time that's really the most exciting is when you get your first military solo. Um, and so now you're in command of this very, very powerful jet. In fact, uh, the one that really strikes me is that uh, when I was in F-16 school, the first four flights, you are in a two-seat, it's called a D model, where there's an instructor in the back seat, you're in the front seat, and he's you know, making sure you don't screw up too badly. And then, you know, after those four or five flights, then you get your first solo in a fighter jet. And it's so cool because you walk out to the airplane, you walk up the ladder, and you get your helmet, you put it down, you get your flight bags, you get in the cockpit ready to get started. And you look up there, and there's no back seat. It's the first time you're in an airplane where there's only one seat. And that's a very cool feeling. Um, OK, so can you also talk about your mother's concerns? Yeah, I mean, I fly an airplane that uh, you know, is, 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 uh, is kind of a fighter jet, so it goes upside down and carries missiles and bombs and you know, you, we read about accidents and things. It's a, it's a profession where the margin for error is, uh, is, is, is tighter than perhaps other things. So uh, it's a standard mother's, mother's concern, and especially post 9-11, it was pretty clear. It was a question of if, not when, when you were, uh, or sorry, it was a question of when, not if, uh, you were going to deploy in support uh, of our nation's goals. And so you know, I think it's a standard mother's reaction. And what is that feeling like? Um you know, to know that you're deploying for the nation's goals. Very, very, very uh, humbling and um, I don't want to call it satisfying, but, you know, <clears throat> no one likes war. In an ideal world, I'd be the best at my job and never use it. But if the country decides that we need to apply force in our nation's interest, you want to be the guy to do that. You've spent several years training for it. You believe in what you can do. Uh, it's like training for the Super Bowl for the whole year and then sitting on the sidelines on game day. So it was very, very um, you know, uh, satisfying to get to go in and, and do your part. And at what point did you feel like you had become a soldier? Become a soldier? Like, was there a moment where you, where you really felt like? Hmm. You know, I think, what, what, I think what, what you're trying to ask is, when does it become real to you? And the day it becomes real is your first combat mission in, an, in a hostile area where you know what you do and how you perform your duties could mean the life or death of a U.S. serviceman on the ground. And so that's very, uh, you know, the gravity of that doesn't really sink in until you're there. And you know that if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't do what you're supposed to do right and the best your ability is, somebody's going to get hurt. Um, so how does that make you feel about the people that you're that are in your unit? Yeah, you get very close to them. I mean, you trust them with their lives daily. I mean, we fly airplanes next to each other at three feet, super fast, and 
you know, you, you trust them. You trust them with your lives. And that's not just your pilots, but it's your maintainers, right? I don't know how to fix an airplane, but I go up to him, the crew chief says, hey, it's good to go. Okay, I only have one engine. So if it stops working, it makes for a bad day. Um, and so who are your, some of your buddies, you know, that you've come up with? Yeah, I've got, I mean, there's, there's lots of uh, good friends that I've made in the, in the flying world. And, uh, you know, the flying culture is very unique, so we all go by our own call sign. So guys like, you know, Francis, Grace, Rico, you name it, we've got names for them. So, yeah, it's, it's a tight-knit group of people. Um, and so how long were you in training before deploying? Let's see, pilot training itself is two and a half years. I went and deployed in 06. I came back from flight school in 04, 05. So, yeah, four years. And where, where was your undergrad? I, I went to Princeton in Jersey. Okay. And what were you studying? I studied this thing called the Woodrow Wilson School. It's like public policy. So it was great. You know, you talk about history, you talk about foreign policy, why the nation is making the decisions that it does. So, you know, for me it was great. So how did you um, use those skills when you were in flight school? You know, I wouldn't say that public policy directly, you know, when you, when you show up, when you're, yeah, when you're a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant in the military, your job is not to make policy. Your job is to execute policy. You're an arm of, you're an instrument of national policy, and you're supposed to do that to your, to your utmost ability. You know, I think eventually, uh, you know, all of us would like to be in a role of, of, of making policy. Um, but, you know, I think having an understanding of history always helps frame things, helps frame the actions that our, our country's doing and why it's important to have a, a secure nation. And so if you look at history, uh, I think it's very informative. Okay. Um... Okay, so when the country was going to war, it, it was controversial. So what was your... Yes and no. I don't think, I, I don't think the initial reaction to the decision to invade Afghanistan was very controversial. We just had 3,000 Americans who were killed on our soil. I think there were disagreements, clearly, uh, about the, uh, the decision to go into Iraq. So uh, what was your... Like, do you have any personal story related to that? Or In what sense? Like, any, any, had anyone ever questioned you? or? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my role, I was, you know, again, my, my job was not to create policy. My job was to execute policy, and, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, happy and willing to do whatever the nation asked. Um, okay, so when did you know that you were going to deploy? Mm -hmm. Let's see, we went in the spring of 06, so I must have known late 05. Take some time to get ready and prepped up and, yeah. So late 05, okay. And um, so that was like four years, basically, right? Four years after I started? Yeah, yeah uh, I think so. Yeah, that's about right, because I started December 01. Yeah, about four years. And, um, and so tell me about telling your family. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, they always knew it was a possibility that I would go, and again, we knew that the way the cycles work, that units rotate in there every year and a half or so, and so we knew it was coming up, and yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was something that was known that was gonna happen, and, and uh, you know, you trust in your training. You've got great training, you've got, you know, great uh, processes to, to get yourself ready. Um, was it emotional for your family? I don't know, you have to ask them. Okay. <laughs> um, and then how long, where were you deployed? I was deployed to Balad Air Base, which is about 30 miles north of Baghdad. So, yeah, I was stationed there, flew combat missions out of there, so I saw the country from the Turkish border down to the Persian Gulf and spent a lot of time over Baghdad. And how long were you there? I was there about two months. Okay. So and then how many tours did you do? That was the only time I've, the only tour I've done. And um, what was your initial, I mean, do you remember what it was like the first time you stepped off, what it smelled like? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think my first takeoff was probably like four in the morning. Um, I saw more sunrises than I've ever seen out there. And, you know, there's a whole ritual of things you have to do to get ready for a combat mission. So you're, you're wearing survival vests and escape uh, and evasion kits, and there's lots of 
things that you're doing to, to prepare. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I certainly remember the, 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 the first mission. Um, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> For people who have yeah. experienced Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, you, you have a lot of, of nervousness, stress. I don't want to say stress. You're just, you, you know, you, your biggest fear is making a mistake. You don't want to. You don't be the guy that screws up and some guy on the ground gets hurt because of it. So you're you're very, you know, you're, you're kind of on edge because you know you want to do it the best you can. Uh, but I think all that goes away once you finally sit in the airplane, strap in, start up the motors, comes to life. You've got all these uh, voices uh, over the radios, and then you're just relying on your your training and you go. It's go time. And what do you see from above? It's great. It's a great view. You're sitting on the end of a pencil. Canopies come down to your waist, so you've got a you've got a great bird's eye view. You can't see the wings are behind you. It's 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 pretty cool. And what do you hear? Uh, you're talking to guys on the ground, so they're asking you. You're talking to them. They're asking you to look at certain things, track bad guys, help them out if they come under fire. So it's it's all everything is in support of ground troops. Um, and do you have any particular stories that you'd want to share or? Well, there's a lot of, you see a lot of interesting things out there. I think the, the, the biggest collective thing I saw and realized was that how dedicated and uh, amazing, I would just say, our ground troops are. Uh, they are, you know, if you look at who's paying the true price of the, these wars, it's not Air Force fighter pilots, it's certainly not politicians and the general public, it's guys on the ground, Army. Marines and you know the Navy and the Air Force have guys on the ground too. But these one, the dudes that are going out on patrol, securing the nation of uh, Iraq or Afghanistan and helping to build uh, uh, you know a, a vibrant uh, economy and, and and secure society there. They're paying the true price of it. So it's very humbling to see that. Okay. So, um, well, what was daily life like on the base? I think I flew every other day, every third day. So I would get up. I think I was flying. I would, we'd take off around five or six in the morning. So it means you show up at the squadron around two or three in the morning, get your flight brief, intel brief, find out what's going on, what's your mission for the day. You'll go take off. Average sorties were four to six hours. Uh, so that you know involves different support missions across the nation of, uh, of Iraq, and you're refueling. Then you land and you'll debrief, talk about what happened, and uh, then the rest of the time you're, you know, you're you're hitting the gym, you're getting ready for the for the next mission. Uh, there's always needs for volunteer people there, so there's a big hospital, biggest hospital in Iraq is there, so they would have us uh, come in and help out there. So. And do you have time for a personal life? Or is it... Well, it's a war zone, so I mean. Uh, again, we're, we're Air Force guys, right? So we come back and land at the base. So it's very different than what an Army guy faces. But, I mean, personal time in the sense that I can get on a computer and email friends at home. Yeah, absolutely. Can I read books? Yep. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to go for a stroll outside the fence, so. And um, is there a rivalry between, you know, the Air Force? And no, of course. It's a friendly rivalry between all the services. You know, Air Force pilots think they're better than Navy pilots and Marine pilots. But at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. It's a friendly rivalry. Um, and what was it like beyond the water? Since I don't know. I mean, I never walked around. I flew over it, but I never, I never walked out on it. Um, and okay, so then after two months, what happened? You came home? Or? Yeah, I came home. I was actually a, I was actually a reservist already at that point, so I had a full time job as a consultant in Philadelphia. So I got activated. I left, and then I came back. Uh, but it gives you a very different perspective on life when you get back, in the sense that it's 10 o'clock at night, you're in a team room, and your teammates are all getting stressed out about some slide or something, and you're like, A, no one's shooting at us, and B, no one's not, someone's going to die if this isn't done perfectly. It's going to be OK. So it gives you a different sense of perspective. And what does it mean to be a reservist for people? Meaning I fly uh, the airplane six times a month to stay current in it, right? It's not a. Can you say being a reservist means? Or so being a reservist means keeping a certain level of proficiency in your skills in the airplane so if the country needs you, they can activate you and send you to a, a, a combat zone. So for me, that means I fly six times a month in the airplane because flying is not something you want to get rusty at. Uh, and then when they need you, they activate you and the unit deploys as a whole and go and do what needs to be done and we come back. 
And uh, what sort of responsibilities do you have monthly? So, so like I said, so I have to go in and fly six times. So that's probably five, six days a month. So it's a, it's a significant time commitment. Okay. And then um, what led you back to business school? Um, you know, I've always wanted to have a, a career in business. Um, I think that the private sector underpins a lot of the strength of the, of the nation, the economic strength of the nation. Uh, I like entrepreneurial things. I like doing things on my own. I was lucky enough to, to start a nonprofit that uh, still exists. Um, and so, so I want to do something entrepreneurial, but I'm focused on uh, the def defense industry because I think the private sector can do a lot to help uh, with, with, our, with our defense base. Um, and so what specifically um, is your current project? So I'm working with a, a team of guys to help build a cybersecurity capability and uh, company f that serves the U.S. government. So how do we secure our networks and keep the bad guys from going in there? I think it's one of the more pressing threats facing the nation. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, is your family still in Georgia? Yeah, my family still lives in Georgia. My parents still live in the small town I grew up in. My sister lives in Atlanta. So yeah, I go to Georgia a lot. It's a good place. So are you considered a local hero there? Or no, 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 no. no. I, wouldn't, I would not uh, go anywhere near that. <laughs> um, so what's it like uh, having now gone through this whole experience going to the base near your home that you had on? Yeah, it's great. I've actually got to take the jet, my jet from Atlantic City down there a couple times to, uh, for some you know, training missions. And it's great to bring the airplane home and have your friends and family come out and see what you do and see the airplane you fly. It's great. Um, and then when you were a kid, like what were your reference points for, I mean some people say like G.I. Joe or like, mythology or did you have anything like that or was it more? Mm, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I didn't play a lot of G.I. Joe. And I think reference points would be folks that I had met on the base that, we, that, lived ne that was next to where we lived. I would say maybe historical figures. Um, Such as? Uh, you know, I, I think I just I read a lot of history. I read a lot of World War II history, Vietnam history, and you know, you see. I think it was very interesting always to see people that put their what they, they put. It was very interesting to see people that would follow what they believed in uh, and were willing to sacrifice uh, significantly to to support what they believed in and the values they believed in. So, and I wanted to be a part of that culture. Were there any particular specific people that you could say inspired you that you knew as a kid? Or? Um, I mean, I think there was some. I think there was a, a, an Indian gentleman uh, that flew in airplanes uh, at our base and became close family friends. So it was good to, to have role models such as that. Um, you know, many of my classmates whose fathers were in the military and flew airplanes, so I got to go on the base and, uh, and meet them. So. It helped make it real in the sense that it wasn't this just amorphous thing you see on TV. You know, it was real people that were doing it, and maybe I could do it. Um, it's interesting that you brought up World War II because I was just researching the Indian Volunteer Army in mm -hmm. World War II, which was like two million troops mm -hmm. and like the largest in history. But then I felt like I had never learned that growing up. You know, um, so I was just looking at you know, the current alliances that are being made and, uh, I mean, do you see, like, a similar thing happening again or... With India specifically? Like India, yeah, like in Afghanistan or in South Asia in general. Yeah, I think, you know, these problems that the world is facing are very, very serious and, and very difficult and it's, they're not problems that one nation or a group will be able to solve on their own. They have deep cultural, economic, political roots and so it takes a... I think a, a team of folks to, to solve them. And so I'm very glad to see that we're, we're partnering with you know, many groups in these nations. And do you feel like you have a particular perspective or like a, a certain insight maybe having in, Indian background? Um, I think maybe uh, in terms of... Uh, an advantage, like if all of these countries are coming together? I don't know. Go ahead. Well, I think, you know, having, I think that's a, one of the strengths of this country is that we have people with very different backgrounds and they can maybe bridge some of these 
cultural divides right now. So I've not personally been in a, a position where I'm interacting with, with you know, Indian partners of any sort, but certainly I have friends who have uh, you know, native Arabic ability and other things which are very valuable when you're trying to build relationships of trust uh, in these nations. Um, okay, so talk about trust and discipline. <laughs> talk about trust well, and discipline. What that means to a soldier, like discipline separately. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think they're both bedrocks of what makes the U.S. military so strong. So trust. You know, when you say tr you trust your, your, your wingmen or your squadron mates or the guys on the ground, that trust means the decisions that that person makes could mean life or death for you. And so there's an immense amount of trust there. And that trust is, is not you know, just given freely, it's, it's, it's earned. And so you know that someone has gone through the same or training programs and they're, you know, they're very, very rigorous and very standards-based that they say they're going to do something or they're going to support you. It's going to happen. So it's very refreshing. Uh, and then discipline, I mean, that, I think that goes hand in hand with it, is, 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 is doing what you say you're going to do, always striving to do the, your job to the best of your abilities because you know the gravity of its, of its success. Um, and also, well, I know with film we're always talking about, okay, when the Indian crew and the American crew try to work together, there's such different uh, like ways of doing things, you mm -hmm. know? Do you see that happening in the military sphere as well with your... You mean how different services or uh, from an yeah, Indian? Like when there are different alliances of uh, you know, units from various countries that may have different ways of operating. You know. Sure. I mean, everyone has their own way of approaching things. And you know, we make fun of the Navy guys for the way they perhaps fly missions versus us. Um, you know, I, I, again, haven't had too much direct contact with uh, other, other nations' armed forces, but... Um, well, how does that work? Do they all live at the same base, or they're separate bases? It depends on the region. Some places they live on the same base, other places they, they don't. Uh, you know, coalition partners are, are very, very important. I've worked with them in the sense... So, yes, yeah, so I have worked with them in the sense that I'm flying a mission and the troops on the ground I'm supporting may have been British or uh, some other European country. So, yes. So work with them, and but you know that's why we have standards and training and things. So it's we try to make it as interoperable uh, as as possible. And then I don't know. I guess from your other maybe maybe if you're talking culturally in terms of just the U.S. military, right? It's a very diverse group. I would like to say, at least at the very uh, more junior levels, that uh, the U.S. military is one of the world's greatest meritocracies. It doesn't matter where you came from, what color you are. It matters how you perform. And if it's, you're flying, it's how you perform the airplane. If you're ground troop, it's how you lead your troops. And that's what you're measured on. And so it's great. It, uh, it was, you know, a lot of people ask me that question because especially amongst the South Asian community of, you know, I went to pilot training in Oklahoma, Vance Air Force Base, you know, an hour and a half from, from Oklahoma City. There's 30 guys in my flight school class. I think, you know, they were probably all white male. We had even one female. We had me and maybe one, uh, one African-American guy. And did it matter that we, some of us had different colors? Absolutely not. And this is in Midwest America, and, and these are, most of the people in my class did not come from your you know, standard East Coast type universities. No, they didn't care. It was very mission focused, very, very values based, and uh, I think that, that, that was just awesome to see. And that's, I think that's what the real heart of America is. Okay, I think that's it. That's it?